Okay, I'm gonna start our English service with announcement for this week. Um, as you guys all know, next week will be the joint service due to the children's fair. So all our worships will be combined into the nine o'clock service. So since it's a unit joint service, I anticipate a lot of people will be coming. So the English service people will come to this place and then we're gonna listen to the service from the, uh, we're gonna participate the service with um, watching the Zoom. Okay, so come here, so we will do the worship. I think the youth department probably going to join us here as well due to the, the space of availability from downstairs because we will be combining first and the second service all together. So I am, we are not quite sure how many church members will be joining next week. So good morning. <laughs> good to see you. So for the sake, we will be coming here so as a youth group. So just remember that. And for, I mean, that's the only one, and that's what the most important announcement that I have for you guys. But, um. I just wanted to share a little bit about the uh, children's fair, how we started it and how long we've been doing this. Yeah, I actually started it out from the elementary department to share the gospel to the kids around this region. So we will uh, reach out to the community for the elementary kids to share the gospel. So we we usually prepare the food, the games, absolutely gospel-oriented activities. So we will reach out to them, reach out to the community, and we invite them to our church. So it was happening every year, except for last year because of the COVID, but we found the other way to reach out to the children's fair. So it's been going on for years. And this year, particularly because of the COVID, a lot of church members, even if its numbers are coming down, they haven't been able to come out to the church to attend the worship. So we are hoping to have them to come out from this opportunity to have them physically come out to the church and restore their worship. And as well as we reach out to the community because the people are having hard time, again, due to the COVID, a lot of people are confined in the house. So they don't really have much time outside, even though it's getting a little bit better due to the vaccination. But we wanted to just have them to come out, have a time of resting, have a time of a good fellowship in Christ. So that's the whole theme of it. Um, so this year, the people who are actually preparing for this children's fair, we are, based off of the five themes from the puppy message from Pastor Chu. So the five themes are resting and healing and including the multi-nation people and prayer and summit. So those are the five themes that we are based off of in terms of preparing this um, children's fair. So I just wanted to relate this idea to you and hopefully we as an English service team can participate. I know a lot of us already playing a role in a different department but those of who are not really maybe they are fairly new to the church or you haven't had any environment with a different department I hope that we, as an English service department, can, can come together as a team. I mean, it's nothing big or fancy. At least, you know, we are, part, as a part of the church member, we participate in one area as an English mission team. So if you have a great idea or if you're willing to help out, just feel free to contact me or contact 
James, or maybe we can come together after the worship and kind of discuss about like what may we can do together. Okay, and then more than anything, your presents are the best. <laughs> And just come out and enjoy. If you have a family, friends, you just invite them. Come up together. There will be lots of food and lots of activities, music and performance. I know Sejin will play saxophone, I think. <laughs> but you guys just saw it during the uh, choir video today. So things like that, we have prepared a lot of stuff. So. Please feel free and invite your friends and families and friends. So come out and have a great time. And also share the gospel with them. We just kind of share the gospel spirit to all the people who will be joining us. Okay? So that's it for the announcement. And then next week, since we are having a joint service, there will be a no announcement, obviously, from our department. But make sure you guys check the Kakao chat room. We will upload it, you know, who will be the messenger and the representative prayers and announcer for the following week after the, the joint service. I mean, the, after the children's fair, which will be, what is it, 23rd? May 23rd, when we come back to our English service. Okay, thank you. You know, as we uh, come in today is to hear the announcements and as we uh, kind of calm ourselves um, to, to center our focus on the worship, um, it's our desire to worship God as he desires to be worshiped. Um, it's our heart to, to sing his praise for what he has done for us. Um, so let's start now. This song is a call to worship to us. Uh, it says, come now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart and to come just as you are and uh, to come before your God. So let's sing this. Uh, we'll start off slow. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, now as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come, one day. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time. Come, now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to give your heart. Come, 
come just as you are, just as you are to worship. Come just as you are before your God. Light of the world, light of the world, you step down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see, beauty that made, beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a life bed with you so here I am so here I am to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me. King of all days. King of all days. Oh, so highly exalted. Glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came. Humbly you came. To the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. And I'll never know, and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross and I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross so here I am to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God and you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. that is your uh, confession. Um, this next song draws us into our previous state before we met Christ and, um, and how Christ has changed our eternal everything. Um, and the lyrics start off with, I was once lost in the darkest night and I thought I knew my way. Um, the sin that promised the joy in life had led me to the grave and I had no hope uh, that God would own a rebel that I'm a rebel to his will. And if God had not loved me first, I would have still refused him. But the chorus ends with hallelujah, all I have is Christ. And hallelujah, Jesus is my life. I hope that this is your, your song today.
I once was lost. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. But as I ran, but as I ran, my held on race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross, and I beheld God's love displayed. You suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me. Now all I know is grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All I have is Hallelujah, Jesus is my life. Now, Lord, I would be yours alone and live so all might see the strength to follow your command could never come, could never come from me. Oh, Father, use, oh, Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose. And let my song forever be my only boast is you. Hallelujah, all I have is Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus is my life. Hallelujah, hallelujah, all I have. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. 
power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. My Jesus, my Savior. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. Sing it all of my days. I want to praise, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. His love is never ending. My comfort, he is my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Yes, let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Let us sing power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of His hands. Forever I love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I had. Oh, nothing compares to the promise I had in you. Amen. God's promise for us is written in his word, and his promise he always fulfills. He always keeps his covenant with us, even when we fall short. Um, as this next song, let's draw close to God this time as we prepare our heart um, for the message we received today. Let us draw close to God. Draw me close. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm a friend. You are my desire, yes. No one else will do. Because nothing else could take your place. To feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find a way. Help me find a way. Bring me back. Bring me back to you. You're all. You're all I want. You're all I've ever needed. You're all I want. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. I lay it all down again 
to hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire. You are my desire. And no one else will do. No one else will do. Because nothing can take your place. Because nothing else can take your place. To feel the warmth of your embrace. Asking you now, Lord, to help me. To help me find a way. Bring me back to you. You're all I want. You're all I've ever needed. You're all I want. Help me know you are need. You're all I want. You're all I want, yes, and you're all I've ever needed, and you're all I want, help me know you are near, help me know you are near. Help me know you are here. And help me know you are near. Help me know you are near. Amen. At this time, we have a representative prayer. Um, today is uh, Sean Fong Oh, and he'll be joining us online. So let's prepare for that. having me um let us just bow our heads and pray <clears throat> lord father thank you for just loving us and being with us every hour of the day thank you god for being there despite our faults despite us falling away from you and always bringing us back to you god i ask you to continue to strengthen us continue to be with us Lord, help send us to the fields as we go and make an impact for your kingdom. God, I ask you to give us that strength, that knowledge, that skill necessary so people could see, God, that you exist, that you live through us. Lord, help us push your kingdom wherever we go. And God, I ask you to watch over um, this ministry, build it up for your kingdom, help them and allow them to just be opened up for you. God, strengthen their ministry, strengthen their service, strengthen their resolve, and strengthen their worship. And allow them always to see, God, that you are truly amazing and you're truly there. God, I ask you to watch over um, the sermon today and the pastor that will be giving it. Allow your words to just flow through them and allow them to be strengthened with you. And then let them be a conduit of your will and your grace towards us as we hold on to this message for this week. God, please always be with us, guide us. And always love us. Forgive us for our sins we've done against you in thought, word, or deed. And help us, God, to see your world here, now, and forever. And that's all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For all of you as well. Um, <clears throat> now we're going to continue relaying the message that we received from last week, uh, the previous week. Uh, the message from last week was the covenant journey to be sought out in Amos. Um, <clears throat> so while preparing the message, um, while preparing the message and praying, I received my inspiration, I think, um, well, I received my inspiration from Exodus, actually. Even though the covenant journey to be saw in Amos is about Amos and the book of Amos, I think maybe because my past Friday service, I received a lot of uh, inspiration uh, from the book of Exodus. <clears throat> and from the last week's message, I, I held on to uh, four key points. Well, actually, I'm sorry. Before we go into the key points, um, 
let's go ahead and uh, I'm sorry, I should have prepared this ahead of time. Let's go ahead and open up our Bibles to Amos 3. <coughs> Excuse me. Amos 3, 7 to 8, which was, <coughs> excuse me, which was last week's um, scripture. Amos chapter 3, verse 7 to 8, and it reads, For the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to, this, to his servants, the prophets. The lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who, cannot, who can but prophesy? There are four points I held on to. From the last, um, from the previous um, message, from the book of Amos, um, the, the four points I re- held on to was first the Corbin ideology, um, second was judgments, the third was repentance or returning to the Lord, and the fourth was the God of justice. Um, now I'm going to kind of t- touch upon each key point throughout, I guess, my message, um, and. So I'm going to talk about these key points throughout the message, but I want to first talk about um, just briefly the book of Amos. So the book of Amos is basically about um, um, Amos, who was, or Amos, who was essentially just a mere peasant, an everyday peasant. He was a shepherd or a fruit picker from the, the Judean village of Tekoa, uh, and, and still yet, even being just an everyday peasant, even though just being a shepherd, God still used Amos. Um, <clears throat> Israelites, or that land of Israel, uh, was the chosen people. Israelites held, possessed the greatest blessing, which is the gospel. But each and every time, they ran into the greatest disaster. Uh, age by age, even though the Israelites uh, held on to God's word, or were give, was given God's word, they even witnessed miracles straight from God, they still failed each and every time, and that's because of idol worship. The greatest reason of failure, uh, the Israelites, uh, Israel's greatest reason of failure was because of idol worship. Now, what is idol worship? If we look at, us, if we look at Exodus 24 to 6, it says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in, in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. <clears throat> idol worship, when I, when I think of idol worship, I, I tend to think about idol worshiping as like a physical act, right? Like, like I can I can idolize my phone, right? The phone is my biggest priority. And actually, that may be true to a certain extent that that this phone is my idol. You know, I'm I'm on it 24/7. But idol worship doesn't isn't necessarily narrowed down to the physical things that you can worship. You know, money, phones, social media. Those are all idols. But even you yourself can become an idol if you prioritize yourself your greed, your desires, that becomes an idol. And if, that, if you prioritize it over God's word, you are idol worshiping, literally worshiping the things that you desire, the things that you deem priority or more important. Um, so before I touch upon Corbin ideology, which actually appears apparently once in the Bible, but last week's message, Pastor was able to talk about this Corbin ideology for well over like an hour. Um, but... I, I, I took the liberty of like kind of researching what the Corbin ideology was and what it basically means. Um, so before I dive into that, I want to give you one example. An example in regarding my coworker, right? I, so I used to work at a restaurant when I was 18 or 19. I used to work at a restaurant. My coworker, uh, her name was Ashley. I hope Ashley's not watching this. Um, <laughs> because this, this person, Ashley, I knew her pretty well, and I knew her father pretty well, too. Uh, it was a single father who take care of Ashley, right? And the father 
pretty much supplied everything for her, right? You know, the, the term daddy's girl? Literally, she was the definition of daddy's girl. Um, Everything in her life, everything that she's gone through, everything that she, ha- she owned was because of her father. Every week I came into work, I hear something happened to Ashley, right? One day she um, was uh, arrested because she, wa- you know, she uh, went to the mall and stole some like, clothes or something like that. So theft, right? Her dad swooped in, saved her out from that crisis. The next week, she got a DUI, driving under the influence, right? Drinking and driving. She came in, she had like a a breathalyzer in a car, right? Breathalyzer means that you have to blow into a thing before you drive your vehicle, right? And then the next week, she says she had to take on a a bunch of uh, uh, um, debt, right? Because she wanted to, uh, I guess, not only go to classes, but also she wanted to purchase this and and the other. Um, I don't know. Every week, something happens, right? Um, Even the job that she works at now, that the restaurant that she worked with me, she only got that job because of her father's, you know, recommendation. So she, you know, he just put her in there. Anyways, this Ashley, you know, she, she did everything she wanted. She got everything she wanted that was supplied by her dad. Her father, I know, to a certain extent, the father is, you know, he was a person who um, came up from the Marine Corps. He was a very proper uh, gentleman. Uh, he's a, someone who I acknowledge very much. You know, he's a very respectable gentleman. Um, so, I, you know, and I was pretty close with Ashley. We worked together on a, on a weekly basis. So, you know, I, I had the opportunity to talk to her. And, you know, every time I talked to her, she said, oh, my dad bought me this. You know, he bought her a new phone. Oh, when she got in a car accident, she, she, he bought her a new car. Like, it's, like, it's like that thing, right? So every time I talked to her, I'm like, wow, you know, Ashley, it must be nice to have a father who can give you a new phone, a new car, save you, give you money whenever something happens. So it must be so nice. And she's like, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's cool and all, but, you know, I, I, I make sure I, I help him out too. You know, I, I give him, like, rent every month, like $300 every month of rent. I'm like, okay, wow, wow. You know, and then I'm like, yeah, I know, you know, I sometimes help him go grocery shopping, you know, I I help him there too. And I'm like, okay, great, great. So this is the story of Ashley, right? And, um, oh, I'm sorry, by the way, for, for, by regards to DUI, don't drink and drive, right? So for those who are younger, right? Those who are driving, please don't get DUI. You know how dumb you look breathing into a thing to drive your car? I'm not looking at you in particular. I'm talking about everyone here, right, who is a bit younger, who's driving. It's not worth it to drink and drive. You know how stupid you look, you know, breathing into a thing so just so you can start your car? Um, anyways, so, you know, that's the story of Ashley, all right? Let's just keep that in mind just for, because I want to kind of reference that throughout the message. So, the Corbin ideology, what is a Corbin ideology? From the words of the pastor, it says, instead of pursuing the change and transformation that God desires, we substitute that with things we deem correct or priority. And I, and, um, I, won't, I wanted to kind of research more about what this Corbin ideology was. And I came across other examples, um, you know, people saying, you know, uh, um, some, some texts saying that uh, Corbin, ide- Corbin ideology is the misuse of evil rationale to avoid doing what they should. Another reference says uh, Corbin ideology is bypassing God's laws and substituting them with their own self-serving traditions. So essentially... For example, um, a Corbin ideology, uh, for example, someone in a church, right? Let's say there was someone who was a bit well off, pretty wealthy, and every work, every week, this person came in and gave thousands of dollars of offering. And to them, that was enough. You know, they, they come in every week saying, oh, I give thousand dollars of offering. I don't, because of the offering that I give, I don't need to essentially worship. I don't need to pray. I don't need to take part in any church activities because what I do is enough. It's kind of like a, a self-serving, for your own kind of self-gratification, for your, for your own satisfaction, you deem that enough. Um, I actually had a personal example for myself uh, back when we were at the Bethlehem Church, the Toilet Church without the Bethlehem Church. You know, we used to go to a tr- we used to rent out a church and we used to go back and forth here and there. Um, but, you know, that was a, couple, a few years back. 
I also fell into this Corbin ideology because, you know, I interpreted there, right? And I also did a lot of work at church. I, I did, I, I was running around doing so much work for the church. And I, ha I developed this mindset of saying, I do so much work for the church. The church should thank me. The God, you know, God should thank me. I do so much for him. You know, what I do is enough. God should be so happy that I'm even here, right? I think, I think to a certain extent that that falls into a Corbin ideology. Um, and so this Corbin ideology, we can reference it. We see this taking place uh, in the Bible as well. And also that story of Ashley, right? That story of her father just supplying her every need, right? And then giving her everything that she wants. And then she says, oh, you know, I give, I help him out sometimes. I give him $300 a month for rent. I help him get gross grocery shopping. That's a Corbin ideology, right? To her, that's like, oh, that's enough for him, right? Even though he may be supplying all my needs, I give him this and I'm like, that's, that's enough for her. That's the sort of Corbin ideology that, that I, I think that what, it, what, what the pastor was referencing. Now, if we continue to look into the Bible, we can see history continues to repeat itself just like how Ashley acts, right? In terms of, let's say the age of Joseph. We know that Joseph was sold into slavery. He was wrongfully incarcerated, he was prisoned. He then went to prophesy to dreams of the pharaohs, and he made his way up to a governor. That's a miracle, right? That's like someone from Korea coming here was, I don't know, sold into slavery somehow, was imprisoned, and suddenly they're like a vice president or something like that. Like, that's insane. It doesn't, it's not normal to happen. And despite hearing these miracles, these Israelites still lost hold of the gospel, right? They lost hold of the gospel. They lost hold of God. And so they were subjected to slavery for 400 years after Joseph. And again, age after age, this continues to repeat itself. Israelites, known as the most blessed people who possess the greatest blessing, which is the gospel, fails each and every time. Age by age, they fail because they lose hold of that gospel. Now, fast forward after Joseph, we see Moses, right? Moses was, um, he, was he, he was an Israelite, but he was, he, uh, he was born Israelite, grew up thinking as an, he was an Egyptian because he was found by the Pharaoh's wife. He grew up in the palace for 40 years. And then, you know, we know that, you know, he kind of discovered that he's an Israelite. So he killed an Egyptian to save an Israelite people. He was an exile from the palace. And then, you know, he met a burning bush, was giving the missions, right? And then fast forward, we, we see the plagues, right? We see the Passover. We see literal pillars of cloud and fire guiding these Israelites through the desert. They crossed the Red Sea. They, they defeated the Amalek army. Literally, miracles after miracles produced by God. They see it, they witnessed it, and yet, when we finally, we come onto Mount Sinai, right? After all this, plagues, Passover, pillows of, literal pillars of cloud and fire, guiding them through the desert, crossing the Red Sea. The Red Sea literally split in front of their eyes. They defeated the army, and now they come to Mount Sinai. In Exodus 32, 4, 5, this talks about Aaron and the gold calf. And for some reason, I, I don't know why, but I just really like to, I, for some reason, this particular uh, verse in Exodus just kind of stuck to me. So the story about Aaron and the gold calf, right? Basically what happened was they finally came to Mount Sinai after going through all these journeys and, and miracles and stuff like that. And so what happens was on Mount Sinai, Moses goes up to the mountain while the rest of his people, Aaron and the rest of the people he took out of Egypt are, you know, waiting for him. Well, this is what happens. In Exodus 32, 4, 5, and he says, it says, And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. <clears throat> and they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. <clears throat> and... Oops. Sorry. Uh, and it says, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So what happened was, 
they were waiting for Moses, right? Moses was up on Mount Sinai, communi communicating with God, talking with God. And while they were waiting, uh, Mo Moses was up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. And I guess while they were waiting with Aaron, they got worried. They started, they started worrying. They were like, what, why is Moses taking so long? Well, you know, what are we going to do now? You know, we went through all this. We're finally out of Egypt. So what's happening now, right? We can see that they're worried. They're anxious. They're struggling. And so what happens was Aaron... And this is what I think. I don't think he necessarily did this out of evil intent or, or, or bad will, but he, he made a golden calf, right? And, and essentially, he said, you know, bow down to this, right? He, he, basically, he basically tells them, uh, because they ask, they ask Aaron, hey, can you, can you make us? He says, uh, they say to him, uh, the people said to Aaron, they ask Aaron, up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. And again, he said, so the, all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their, ears, in their ears and brought them to Aaron and received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool made a golden calf. <laughs> And Aaron said to them, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be feast of the Lord. He made them a golden calf to bow down to. A golden calf, right? Although it was God who brought them out of Egypt, who, who, who literally gave them miracle after miracle, saving them each and every time, he, this Aaron produced a golden calf, uh, this golden calf, although I don't necessarily think that the golden calf itself is important, but we can see he literally produced an idol, right? An idol for them to worship, an idol to make them feel at ease. And then, so while Moses was on Mount Sinai, and this was all going on, he was talking to God, and God was like, stop, wait, something is, something is wrong, right? He tells, he talks to Moses, and he says to Moses, Go down for your people, uh, Exodus 32, 7, 10. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way I commanded them. They have made for, them some, for, they have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me, now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation of you. At this scene, we can see that God is pissed. He wants to just kill all of them, right? Out of, like, I mean... Out of everything that they endured, out of, every, out of all the miracles that, they, that, they, that God finally brought them through, they're like, let's worship a golden cow, right? Like, you know, from my perspective, I can only imagine how angry God is. But then we see, right, we see that Moses tries to leverage with God and says, you know, you brought them out of Egypt. You went through all that using your mighty hand. You brought them out of Egypt. Let me go talk to them. So Moses goes to them, and he goes down. In Exodus 32, 21 to 24, and it says, Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you have brought a, such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people that they are, not, they, that, that they are set on evil. For they said to me, Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, let any who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me and threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. He literally said, I put gold in the fire, and out came a golden cow. I don't, I don't know how exactly that works, but to me, again, I think I see a bit of a, a Corbin ideology in this, right? This golden calf directly relating to idol worship. Again, it is a type of Corbin ideology that I think uh, is portrayed in this particular scene. Uh, he produces a calf so that they can bow down to it. They're, they're prioritizing this golden calf, this figure over God. Um, and then, so we, we, we see the Corbin ideology. We see, now we're going to see um, judgment from God, right? 
Exodus 32, 26 to 30, it says, Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from the gate to gate throughout the camp. And each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. And Moses said, Today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you, th- upon you this day. The next day Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So you can see God's judgment, judgment on these people. Um, but what I want to emphasize is not, is not the judgment that God brings upon um, upon the people, but it's the fact that although we've heard that from from Hosea we learn that God, that the God, our God is a God of love. From Jeremiah we see God of hope. In this book of Amos we see the God of justice. Uh, and the pastor says that you know the only uh, God uses the word judgments, but he doesn't necessarily desire judgments. He played the he plays a role of a judge to preserve life and to preserve order for the future. Just like in the age of Noah, when the world was riddled with sin and wickedness, God had to pour his judgment in the, in the shape, in, in the name, in, you know, he had to judge that age with a flood. But God is not a God of evil, right? He, he, I think he always tries to give them some type of warning and the warning comes in the person of, like, for example, Amos, or Hosea, Jeremiah, Joel. These are all prophets that God used to warn the people. They, he uses them saying, hey, tell them of the impending disaster, of the impending judgment that is coming your way. And like these people, these people, these main figures in the Bible, you know, they, some of these people aren't, aren't even the greatest people. Um, Amos, as I said, is a shepherd, a fruit picker, right? Uh, Joseph, he was a slave. He was, a, he was in prison at one point. David, again, was a mere shepherd. Yet all these individuals God used to carry out his mission. And so our goal as children of God, we also strive to become like these main figures in the Bible. And then... And it says in Amos 5, 6, Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and it devour with none to quench, for it, it, quench it for Bethel. In chapter 9, Amos tells of the restoration and hope of Israel. In that day, I will raise up the fallen booth of David and wall up its breaches. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. The only way we can really escape this disaster, well, let me, let me say it again. Disaster is present in each age, in the age of Joseph, in the age of Moses, in the age of Noah. There is a disaster. Even now, there's a disaster now, right? We are in the age of technology. We are in the age of science. We are in the age of social media. And these are all things that control our lives, you know, whether we know it or not, and whether we like to acknowledge it or not. This literally controls our lives, and it's, it's, it's rooted in our lives. And although tech, technology and, and, and technology, social media, all that is rapidly advancing, at this point in time, churches are closing their doors, and the gospel is disappearing more and more. We have to be or strive to be like, you know, Amos, Jeremiah, who... who who God uses regardless of our status to block the disasters of this age. So again, we are called as the ones to block the disaster of this age, like Jeremiah, like Amos. And again, um, I think for me, I really held on to this Corbin ideology because it, it, I, I personally think that this Corbin ideology resides in each and every one of us to a certain extent, right? We like to justify doing something because we deem it correct, right? Like we say, oh, you know, doing this will cover everything else. And I think that's present, well, I, I know that's present in, in my life, uh, definitely. 
But pastor says, you know, li- this Corbin ideology is living walk of faith for yourself, for your, for your own gratification and satisfaction. The only way to escape the impending disaster is repenting or returning back to the Lord. So we see the Corbin ideology. We see the judgment that God, that God proclaims. We see that the only way to escape this judgment, this disaster, is by re- repenting, returning back to the Lord. And again, we see that this God of justice, as a person myself, whenever I read about God, I always think, why does God, why is sometimes God's pretty cruel to be honest but I mean that's just my own mindset like that's my that's my limited knowledge of the Bible and my limited knowledge of God but like you know sometimes I'm like why couldn't God just spare these people why couldn't God just not kill these people his own children right but pastor explains it like he has to do this in order to preserve life he has to do this in order to preserve order in the, for the future. Again, in Exodus 32, 10, right? It says, Now therefore let me, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation of you. In this scene, again, this is when, you know, they were worshiping the golden calf, they were having a festival, having a party, while, Mount, while Moses was talking with God on Mount Sinai. And yet, although God, you know, he, he, he relents, he, he's mad, he's enraged, he still thinks about Israelites, making, making them a great nation. And to make a great nation, what do you have to do? You have to weed out all the impurities, all the bad things, you know. Sure, in, in a human's perspective, in my opinion, there may be better ways to weed out the impurities, the evils. But... I can't dare think about or even scratch the surface of how God thinks, you know. What he's thinking and what he's doing and what he's planning, I cannot even fathom that. But as the pastor says, he does this in order to preserve life, to save more lives. And I think that this is something that is actually true and something that, you know, we have to, you know, just think about. Why does God this? God do this, you know. As I, uh, this organization, this type of organization, and I continue to say this, is that the problems in our lives are present. The problems given to us <clears throat> are permitted by God because these problems allow us to grow stronger in our faith. The problems in our lives allow us to grow closer to God. The problems in our lives, although we don't need problems, no one wants problems, we don't have to have problems, right? God doesn't need to give us problems, but he does because that problem is a blessing. And in, in that same perspective, I think we should look at these disasters, these judgment the same way. Um, and also, my last comment is that these Israelites who, who are the most blessed people, right? These Israelites who possess the greatest blessing, which is the gospel, but yet fail each and every time, age by age, they fail. We are those Israelites, right? And this is what Pastor says, we are the Israelites. Whenever we see those, read about the Israelites, we are those Israelites. We are Ashley, right? We, we, we are that Ashley who just continues to just receive things and then just says, oh, you know, but I, you know, I give, I pray. That's enough for God, right? I, I you know, I, I say Jesus is the Christ. That's enough for God, right? I give my offering every week. That's enough for God, right? And I think I like to see. I think that in that in that sense, that we are all Ashleys, or we are all Israelites. And so the the conclusion is that the way the way to seek the Lord is holding on to the Word of God. The message the message of Amos is to seek the Lord, then you will live. Why does God punish? He does that out of love because he knows that there is a greater impending disaster and he brings judgment to save more people. Pastor says that God's weak spot is repentance, returning back to the Lord. And I think we can start doing that by examining you know, our lives. What is a Corbin ideology that is consuming our lives, that's present in our lives? And how can we fix that? How can we, how can we, how can we, how can we combat that in our lives? Um, so with this, um, because we kind of have to prepare for Mother's Day and stuff like that, let's, let's go ahead and end this uh, with prayer.
I'll pray. Father God, we thank you for today for gathering us uh, in the name of English sir, in the English name of English worship. Father God, um, there is a disaster that has befallen this age. Would you please strengthen us and equip us with your word and allow us to really discard any kind of Corbin ideology that may be present in our lives and may you use us like like Amos, like Jeremiah, like Joseph and Moses, to be the ones to block the disaster of this age. Father God, please use each and every one of us and allow us to really hold on to your word that we've received. Please break down all the force of darkness that may be hindering us, our, that may be hindering us and us in our covenant journey, Lord. We thank you so much, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Give thanks to our messenger who relayed the gospel to us today um, from the book of Amos. On the covenant journey, we should see. Um, let's hold on to the words that we've heard today. Let's not forget the message that God has for us individually in our lives. Um, you know, seek the Lord and live. We heard that in the scripture today. Seek the Lord and live. And um, so let's seek the Lord with this song, singing, We will worship you. Lord, we come before your throne, humbled and amazed. Your greatness overshadows every idol of the sage. For all the treasures of the world, Lord, cannot replace the greatest joy of knowing you and walking in your grace we will worship you there is none beside you we will worship you there is none beside you we will worship you there is none beside you lord lord we come with thankful hearts into your courts with praise rejoicing in your favor delighting in your ways for all the lost cannot compare Lord, to what we've gained, for there is none like you, O God, the name above all names, and we will worship you. There is none beside you, and we will worship you. There is none beside you. And we will worship you. There is none beside you, Lord. The song really hit me today with the scripture that we shared. There's, His greatness overshadows every idol of this age. And it's a declaration that I will worship him. This, as we close out our uh, service to worship our God. Um, let's sing the next song, Ancient Words, um, knowing that God's word changes people. Um, it is God who, whose word is ever true. Um, and let us, let's continue to come to God every day with open hearts and seek his word. Holy words, long preserved for our walk 
in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Words of life, words of hope, give us strength, help us cope. In this world, where'er we roam, ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh, let the ancient words impart. So it's God's word that changes us. Um, I don't want you to think that when you come to Christ, everything's going to change for the worse or that he's going to make you change. I think that it's a natural response of the scripture for God to change our hearts. So let's come to him willingly with that message. Holy words. Holy words of our faith handed down to this age came to us through sacrifice. Oh, heed the faithful words of Christ. Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. We have come. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Um, I guess have a blessed week. Um, please stick around uh, for those of you who are here to enjoy Mother's Day meal, and I hope that you all will join us again next week. God bless.